Father, we do indeed praise you. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we praise you. We thank you that we can gather and look to you, Father, and know you through Christ and through your Spirit at work amongst us today. Lord, pray you would draw us closer to you through uh, fellowship together, through singing and worshipping together, and through your word that is true and living. Lord, pray you'd open our hearts, open our eyes to what you're saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. I want to tell you first of all about the heartache I went through at university. Uh, so university, some might uh, be able to sympathise with me. Uh, the, um, the amount of exams you have to do and assignments and, and uh, it, it's busy, busy. I'm talking about an engineering degree here. I won't say any more. Uh, but I, I remember one year, we, the, the, the busiest year, it was probably our final year, uh, so we're almost about to finish the whole lot, but we've got these exams ahead of us. And you're like, oh man, and I, had, I think I had eight exams. One of them was an eight hour exam, a full day exam. Uh, another one was worth 100%. Well, who would do that to someone? Worth, it was fail or pass or fail, do or die. Uh, as well as all the other exams and all the other pressures, uh, we had to pass. We had jobs hanging on the line and everything. They were waiting for, and so we all worked to the bone really, weren't we? It was like you know, slave driving in a way. Uh, uh, but I want to try and relate to you the feeling when you come out of that final exam. Who's had this? You probably remember back at school as well. You know, that was when you start the exam, by the way. Uh, but the feeling when you finally come out of the exam and you're finished, it's like, ah, oh, I'm free. All these exams behind me, I'm free. I can go to the beach and do things like this. Uh, uh, that feeling, it was like euphoria and you're sort of wandering around in a bit of a daze, right? Who's, who relates to me on this one? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, how much more, let me ask, how much more would the Israelites have felt when they walked away from slavery for the last time? As God freed them out of bondage and as they walked free, men and women and children out of Egypt, away from a life of oppression, of brutality, to freedom, set free. As it says in chapter 13, verse 14 of Exodus, uh, and it's repeated over and over again as we go through Exodus, the rest of Exodus. With a mighty hand, the Lord brought uh, you out of slavery, out of the land of slavery. With a mighty hand, the Lord did this. Now, walking out of my last exam doesn't really cut it when it comes to understanding the freedom that the Israelites must have felt uh, when they were finally able to walk away uh, from their final day of brick making and their final day of gathering straw. Uh, because what did I do when I walked out? Like I said, I kind of walked around in a daze. I didn't quite know where to go. Do I go to the beach, to the pub, <laughs> which was what I did then? Uh, but there was no, it was sort of like free. What do I do now? But the Israelites saw what had happened. They were set free, a whole new life ahead of them. But set free, they knew by God himself. He had destroyed the power of Pharaoh. He had triumphed over the so-called gods of Egypt. He, he had defeated the Egyptian army. He had saved them and brought them out of Egypt. And so naturally their, their focus as they leave this behind them, and as they walk out free, is to where? To God, to none other than God. He's the focus of their response. And we're going to hear that soon as we hear what they, how they responded in chapter 15 of Exodus. Uh, but first I want us to kind of recap where we've got to as we've come through Exodus. Uh, we'll recap what has happened. Uh, some of us, most of us, maybe know uh, something of the story of Exodus. But uh, let's watch this so we can come up to speed to where we're up to in Exodus 15. Let's talk about the book of Exodus. Now, you're probably familiar with this book because of the epic story of Moses leading Israel out of slavery from Egypt. Yeah, but that's just the first half of the book. The second half has Moses giving the Ten Commandments to Israel along with these blueprints for making a sacred tent. 
Now, right here in the middle is the story that connects these two halves together, and it all takes place at the foot of a famous mountain. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. So the first thing we have to remember is we're continuing the story from Genesis. Yeah, in Genesis, God promised Abraham that through his family, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And Genesis ends with Abraham's family down in Egypt. When Exodus begins, 400 years have passed, the family grows and becomes the people group now called Israel. But there's this huge problem because the Israelites are enslaved to this king of the Egyptians, a guy called Pharaoh. This guy is really bad news. Yeah, he's horrible. He, he disregards their humanity, he brutally enslaves them, and he even orders that all of the Israelites' sons should be killed by throwing them into the Nile River. He wants to wipe these people out. He's the worst character in the Bible so far. Here's where we meet an Israelite woman who wants to save her son. And so she does throw him in the river, but safely, in this little reed basket. And Pharaoh's daughter finds this baby and takes him as her own. And this is the boy who grows up to become Moses, the man who will rescue Israel from slavery. So Moses grows up, and one day, much later in his life, he has this crazy encounter with God where he comes across a bush that's on fire but it isn't actually burning up. And God speaks from the bush, and he appoints Moses as the man he will use to deliver Israel. So Moses goes to Pharaoh to tell him this, this news that God wants his people free. And Pharaoh, he just pretty much laughs at him. He's like, Who, who's this God, Yahweh? And in fact, he's so offended by this request, he decides to make the Israelites work even harder. So discouraged, Moses goes back to God and says, listen, this plan's not going to work. But God repeats his promise that he's going to rescue them. And in fact, it's right here for the first time in the Bible that we hear the word redemption. It literally just means to purchase a slave's freedom. But God here uses this word to describe what he's going to do for enslaved Israel. And God knows Pharaoh is going to resist. So he sends 10 different plagues, one after another, like turning water into blood, sending all sorts of pests and disease. These plagues are really severe. They are severe, but we need to understand that the story is presenting these as acts of divine justice against one of the worst oppressors in the story of the Bible. And they're all aimed at the purpose of rescuing these enslaved people and defeating the gods of Egypt. This all comes to a climax at the 10th plague, where God's going to kill the firstborn sons across all Egypt. Every house, it's pretty rough. It is, but it's also God's response for how Pharaoh killed the Israelite sons. Now as you turn the page, you suddenly get two long chapters of detailed instructions for what's essentially throwing a dinner party with a recipe for a lamb. Yeah, but this lamb is super important. God tells the Israelites to pick it out and to prepare it to be eaten. And they're supposed to take its blood and then paint it all over the doorframe of their house. And anyone who is in that house will be spared from this final plague. And so this meal, which is called Passover, it commemorates this key moment in the story where God brings his justice on human evil, but also shows mercy by providing this substitute. This final plague makes Pharaoh angry, and he demands that Israel gets out of Egypt, which is great. But suddenly, as they leave, Pharaoh changes his mind. He has a change of heart. But on top of that, we're also told that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Why would God do that? Well, what we need to remember is that over and over in this story, Pharaoh has already chosen to harden his own heart. And so at this point, Pharaoh, he's not just evil, he's become monstrously evil. Even his own advisors think that he has gone way too far. And so how is God supposed to deal with such an extreme form of evil? And what we see in this story is that God uses his power to lure evil into its own destruction. Pharaoh and his army are destroyed in the Red Sea as Israel passes into freedom. And after this, we find the very first song of worship in the Bible as the people praise God for redeeming them. And it's in this story that the word salvation is also used for the first time, which means simply to be rescued from danger. So there's the, the journey so far for the people of Israel and we've looked at a lot of those aspects over the last few weeks as we've been going through this series that we're calling Set Free, uh, Set Free from Slavery. As you saw uh, just now, what they did when they came out of Egypt, their first response, they came across the Red Sea, was to praise and to rejoice in this amazing salvation that God had brought about. And they, they gathered on the shores of the Red Sea and, and praised God. And they sang a song with tambourine in hand. It says, Miriam, uh, 
verse 20 of chapter 15, and with all the rest of the women, they led all the people in the song of praise. And it's quite interesting, this, this song that they sing. And there's a few things about it. One of the things is it's really poetic in, in the Hebrew language. You, it doesn't really, uh, doesn't really work when you translate it. It kind of becomes a bit dull and boring in English. But in Hebrew, it's really poetic. Poetic is the language of the heart, of the emotions, as they rejoice in this thing that's been done. Uh, there are a lot of firsts in the song they sing as well. It's the first song of worship, really, in the Bible. First song of worship. It's the first time that God is spoken of as, as a warrior, the one who fights and wins the victory for his people. It's the first time uh, that salvation is mentioned, uh, the idea of being rescued from danger. It's the first time that the idea of uh, God redeeming his people is actually kind of owned by the people. This idea of God buying their freedom for them. Uh, and, it, and it's really referring back to the Passover, the Passover lamb that Eric talked to us about last week. It's the first time that the whole idea of God being present with his people, dwelling with them, is acknowledged and, and rejoiced in by the people. It's the first time that the land that God promised that he's going to take them to is talked about as a place of rest and sanctuary. Uh, words that uh, liken it to this new Garden of Eden that God's going to uh, bring them to. And can you imagine the, the, the way that would be seen as they've come out of slavery and this promise that God gives them? They're all, all these are like major themes that start taking shape more and more throughout the Bible uh, that, that are here in this song of praise that we're going to hear very soon. Uh, and actually, of course, that are fully worked out and understood when Jesus comes. And we'll get to that soon. So when you hear the song of praise that these people sing, you don't only hear them praising and being thankful for what God has done as they look back, but also uh, looking as they look forward and seeing where God is leading them, this new life that God's uh, bringing them into. So I'm going to read from chapter 15. You might want to follow along if you've got, the, got your Bibles, chapter 15. As they look back to what God's done, you'll notice the language is pretty... Uh, pretty um, direct and and it might sort of we might struggle with our 21st century sensibilities but remember this was them acknowledging that that God had come with judgment on those that were oppressing them to free them and so it was a very real thing as they understood what God had done so let's hear the song of praise that they sung the very first response as they recognized God's salvation so then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers have drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who oppressed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. And then verse 10 goes on. But you blew with... Your breath and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Eden will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. By the power of your arm, they will be as still as stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you bought pass by. You will bring them in and plant them, establish them on the mountain of your inheritance. The place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, your hands establish. The Lord will reign forever and ever. Amen.
can hear as they sing. This is where we've come from. Look what you have done to get us here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Praise your name. This is where you're leading us on to do. This is what you promise. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. You know, God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And he still calls a people out of slavery to a new life. He still wants people to trust him and look back to what he's done, sending Jesus to die for, on the cross for our sin, to make salvation possible, and say, thank you, Lord. Praise your name. But also to look forward to what he promises and to what he calls those who put their faith in Jesus to, what he wants to do with the people that call on his name. You know, I love this picture of these Israelites on the shores of the Red Sea, on the cusp, if you like, between their old life and the new one to come. Their first response to praise God. And it seems to me it's such a great uh, picture of someone also who comes to faith in Jesus. Standing there on the shore, looking back across to Egypt, is like looking back to your old life or a life without, outside of Christ. A life lived separate from God, self-centered, bound by sin and evil, but yet now you're on the banks of the Red Sea and you know that the very reason that you have journeyed this far and out of that land of, of death, that old life is because God has won a victory for you because Jesus died on the cross, our Passover lamb, for our sin and shame to set us free from the slavery that that brings. That's what we look back on. That's what gives reason for praise and thankfulness. Jesus sacrificed to make this new life possible. Tell me just as a break, as a question, if we are making this parallel between those coming out of Egypt into a new life with those except Christ. What do you think the Red Sea can be paralleled with? I heard, I heard it. Yep, baptism. Baptism. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 actually makes us lick. We read this. For I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers, the Israelites, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Uh, this was quite a focus in the early church as well, by the way. Didymus the Blind, if you've ever heard of Didymus the Blind, uh, not Didymo, Didymus, 178 AD, uh, says this. And so the whole history of the flight from Egypt is a type of the salvation obtained through baptism in Christ. Egypt represents the world in which we harm ourselves if we live badly. The people are those who are now enlightened in Christ. And the waters which are for these people the means of salvation represent baptism. The crossing of the Red Sea was the seal of victory of their salvation. Now they truly are God's people. And in a similar way, baptism is now the sign and seal of salvation in Jesus, showing we truly are God's people. Does that make sense? We're, um, we've got a baptism in two weeks. Sophie Gray is being baptized. That is a seal of her salvation a sign that she is now on the banks of the Red Sea, stepping out in faith and looking to God. If we keep thinking about our friend who loves God and has decided to follow Jesus, uh, standing on the shore, the shore of the, the, the Red Sea, looking back to uh, their old life and to Jesus' death and sacrifice and, uh, that set us free, the natural response is to praise, and that is right. Um, like the Israelites, they're looking back. He's looking back. Look where we've come from. Look what God's done. Thank you, Lord. Praise him. But remember, as we think about this, like for the Israelites, there's far more to salvation than this. Because as they stand on the cusp between their old life and their new, they also look forward, even in this song of praise, to what God has promised, to where he is leading them, to a purpose as his people, to a new life ahead of them. 
And we hear this at the end of the song of praise, verse 13. If you are unfailing, in your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them uh, to your holy dwelling. And at the end, verse 17, you will bring them and plant them, establish them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling. It's all the promise that, that God is bringing them into, setting them free for. You know what, though? Our friend on the shores of the Red Sea, who has accepted Jesus, so often never turns around, so often just stays there, kind of rooted to the spot, looking back to where he's come from. Sure, praising God because of it, praising God for Jesus, set free from slavery, from sin, but, but never turning around and to see where this new life in Jesus now leads. Never turning to ask the question, now what? And so never carrying on the journey that God calls us onto and always really only singing half this song of praise in Exodus 15. You see, in the second half, at the end of this uh, song of praise, God promises that he would dwell with his people. And he does that now by his spirit. He, he promised uh, to the Israelites that he would plant and establish a people. He is doing that now by building his church. He promised to bring his people into a promised land, a place of rest. And we look forward to eternal rest in the new creation in the presence of Jesus. Salvation is all this and much more. But because our friend fails to turn and see all this, he also fails to understand and point people and live out an even bigger vision of God and what God's doing in this world and the world to come. Part of what we want to do here at St. Stephen's is, is help people not only cross over the Red Sea, in other words, find salvation in Christ, but also to come to know more and more the huge vision and purpose that God calls us to as his church. And partly that's what our discipleship pathway uh, at St. Stephen's seeks to do. DNA, life, equip, is designed to, to kind of challenge each of us as we walk through it to see where is God leading, to challenge us to not only look back to what God's done in Christ, but to look forward to what he's doing, what he's going to do, and what he calls us to. To be equipped for that, to commit to that. Because once we get this, once we grasp the purposes of God in Christ, and just how huge and large and wide they are, and see that he calls us to be part of this, he calls us to so much more than simply standing on the shores of the Red Sea and gazing back to our old life. Once we grasp this, it's so much easier and natural to simply step out in faith because we know, know that God is leading us and has promised so much more. It means we're so much more likely to sacrifice our own life for the sake of Christ because we see this bigger picture. So much more likely to expect that God will draw others into his church. Expect that God's church will grow, that this church will grow. So much more likely to step in, out in faith with uh, big ideas like, like starting a veggie stall out the front of church or kids club on Thursdays to try and reach the community around us. So much more likely to change our careers perhaps because we see it helps serve God better. So much more to even do crazy things like go and talk to our neighbour about Jesus. Because we know God is leading us on. We've turned from our old life and are now walking in our new life. Towards what God calls us to, with the promises he gives us in Christ, the new creation that we can hope in, and all that comes with that is he works by his spirit. That's what it means to be set free. That's what it means to be set free. And that's really what the rest of Exodus will help us understand. Set free to follow is our next short series through Exodus. And then we'll finish with set free to worship. 
where we see that there's more to this life than just looking back at our old life. There's actually a whole vista, a whole journey out ahead of us as God leads us on, as we live out the promises he gives us in Christ. And as we, like the Israelites, praise and thank him and rejoice because of all of it. If you were standing on the banks, the shore of the Red Sea this morning, where would you be looking? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that through him, you have won the victory for us. You have brought us out of slavery and you call those, call us all to put our faith in you. Lord, pray if we have not done that, pray that we'd do that now. Lord, convict us of the absolute need for you, Christ, and your salvation and grace. But Lord, don't stop there. Convict us also of the need to look further to where you're leading and where you do lead through your spirit at work. As you lead us and shape us to serve you to grow your church, to build your kingdom as we live in the hope of a new creation and the true promised land. Lord, help us step out in faith on this journey. If you want to respond in prayer, or just in your hearts, let's do that now.